George O'Connor here, Big Up Julius, Ring IQ, welcome to the mother Relay. Welcome to the mother Relay, we're covering today's top boxing news! Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Dina Thorsland boxes past Yuli Hangaluna to unify the WBO and WBC bantamweight titles alongside the ring magazine belt, which was on the line for this fight, number one versus number two at 118 pounds. I expected things to be tense between them, and it was. Holster Bro Denmark, WBO bantamweight queen Dina Thorsland added the WBC title to her collection with a unanimous decision win over Mexican Yuli Hangaluna. Then WBC champion Thorsland was relaxed in her pressure, and Luna couldn't keep her away. It was scored 97-93, 99-91, and 98-92 in a fast-paced fight with no highlights. Luna had her moments in the early rounds, but Thorsland upped the pace and was a clear winner in the end. WBA bantamweight champion of the United Kingdom, Nina Hughes, was ringside calling the action and scouting the winner. It was a tense battle between them because in Yuli Hang Luna, what you had was a very tall bantamweight weight and a very long bantam weight that likes to move lateral and set traps so you can't just bust through the front door you might get counted dina thorsland had yuli hang luna under pressure throughout the entirety of the fight yuli hang luna for me and my money was too willing to give up ground yeah too willing to give up real estate to set traps too yeah. complacent she sacrificed a lot of time and a lot of rounds doing that trying to time Dina Thorsland's entry, Dina's feet just a little faster, her hands. Just enough speed to get some punches in. She was quicker than Yuli Hang Luna, and I think that made a difference. In tandem with the pressure. She was effectively staying with Yuli Hang Luna, staying on her, on top of her, as Yuli Hang Luna moved lateral, tried to create space. Dina Thorsland stalking her. I mean, you could tell they were giving each other a lot of respect, because it wasn't easy for Dina to get those punches off. She had to time her entry, at times overshooting the distance and ending up in a clinch with Yuli Hang Luna. Awkward position. Even though Yuli Hang Luna didn't land very many punches, you could see that what punches she did land, they got Dina's respect. Enough that she didn't just go busting through the front door being cavalier. She had to measure her approach, try and time her entry as best as she could because she was dealing with a fighter that's a lot taller, a lot longer, and mobile. Strong too. Yuli Hang Luna, she doesn't have as many knockouts as Dina Thorsland, but that doesn't mean she doesn't pack an authoritative punch, especially off the counter, off the back foot. That's what she likes to do. Set her opponents up, but it was ill-advised. On the road. Ill-advised to employ that strategy in Denmark because you're spending too much time circling away, too much time on the ropes, too much time looking for a single counter, a single shot. Holding the center of the ring would have translated better to the judges. Fighting for dominance in the center of the ring. Not saying that Yuli Hang Luna should have sold out and traded punches in the pocket at that range. That actually favors the small stumpier fighter with the shorter arms but pivots to halt the center pivots and shifts as the smaller fighter comes forward that would have allowed Yuli Hang Luna to halt the center of the ring and not give off the impression that she's being bullied that she's being pushed around because that is how it looked she seldom ever stepped into her punches she was too reactionary always second pass Dina initiated most of the action Dina initiated the exchanges and all Yuli Hang did was react to them with limited success at a moment in this fight where Yuli Hang Luna was the one stepping into her jab, bringing punches over, and backing Dina into the ropes. Most of this fight, Yuli Hang Luna spent it on the move. Back on the ropes. You do that long enough, the judges are going to think you're spending the fight on the run. Most of it. Had the fight something like nine rounds to one. Nine rounds in favor of the hometown fighter, Dina Thorsland. Not because she was going in there and ragdolling Yuli Hang Luna. She wasn't. Not because she was having it all her way, but she was the consistently busier fighter. Because Dean is throwing more punches than Yuli Hung, because Yuli Hung is spending most of the fight circling away, back on the ropes, pot shotting just one and two punches at a time, she just wasn't doing enough. So this allowed Dina to pick up most, the vast majority of the rounds. The prediction stuck. I went with Dina Thorsland to win behind being the busier puncher, the busier, more aggressive fighter. She is now this division's ring magazine, lineal, and unified champion, leaving only Nina Hughes holding the W. WBA and Ebony Bridges holding the IBF. Two fighters that are capable fighters, yeah. strong punchers, but both older than Dina Thorsland. Dina's 29. Nina's in her late 30s and Ebony's in her mid-30s. No, Dina's been around longer than the both of them and the 
pro ranks, and she's a more accomplished fighter than both of them. She's a two-division champion. Lineal, Ring Magazine, and Unified now. She's a hard fight, a very hard fight for the both of them. And with them, unlike with Yuli Hung, you know, Ebony, Nina, these are not long and limber bantamweights like Yuli Hung was. So what elicited so much respect from Dina in this fight, that won't be in play with either Nina Hughes or Ebony Bridges. No, they're short and stocky fighters. Where Yuli Hung Luna is a long and limber, long-range fighter, the both of them are mid-range to inside fighters. Pocket-sized fighters that like to fight in the pocket. Which is actually more up Dina Thor's Lin's alley. She's very good in the pocket, very good in an out game, very bouncy Fast. and strong. A very difficult fight for either Nina Hughes or Ebony Bridges. It was tough for Dina to manage the distance against Yuli Hung because Yuli Hung is taller and longer. She's a counterpuncher. More boxer than brawler. Whereas both Nina and Ebony, they're prone to brawling. They're prone to trading punches and exchanges mid-range to inside. So like I said, it's gonna be a tough fight for the both of them when the time comes. But now, congratulations to Dina Thorsland. 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 I picked her to win a points decision and that's exactly what she did. She is this division's unified champion. On super middleweight news ahead of the biggest fight of his career, Jermel Charlo says a win over Canelo will stamp me as one of the greats. Not that I'm picking him to win, because I'm not, though he is right. If he were to win, if he were to prove the doubters and the naysayers wrong, jumping up two weight classes for the super middleweight division's undisputed champion, he would go down in history as one of the greats, one of the few two-time undisputed champions. It's a very short list. For years now, Charlo has considered himself one of the best fighters in the world. Should he take care of business and beat Alvarez in his first fight in the super middleweight division, Charlo will look back proudly as confirmation of what he already knew. It'll let me know that I'm where I should be, said Charlo to a group of reporters when asked what a win over Alvarez would mean to him. Through years of backbreaking labor behind the scenes and big time wins in front of the camera, when Alvarez chooses to walk away from the sport, he'll march straight into the Hall of Fame. And Jermel? Well, in a scenario where he beats Canelo Alvarez after having jumped up two weight classes to do it, his Hall of Fame ticket will be punched as well. He would become a two-time undisputed Ring Magazine and Lineal Champion in that scenario. I'm not saying that's what I think is going to happen, though if it did... His ticket to Canastota is punch. A win over Canelo will stamp me as one of the greats. It would. Not just punching his ticket to the Hall of Fame, Charlo believes that a win over Canelo would lead to fights with David Benavidez, with Caleb Plant. Naturally, those are the guys the PBC has up there. Now, David Benavidez, he's supposed to be fighting Demetrius Andre in a box office fight this upcoming fall, oh. Caleb Plant. Now he's coming off a row with Jermel's brother, Jamal. He slapped the taste out of his mouth. Don't know if that's going to materialize into a fight. But that is the latest. Regardless of whoever is thrown in his direction, as long as he takes out Canelo Alvarez, Charlo will be willing to face them all. I take his belts, then I gotta fight the Mexican monster, David Benavidez, the Caleb Plants, and I gotta fight all the big boys, Charlo told a group of reporters. Sounds good. I'ma have all the motherfuckers trying to fight me. Not exactly a clear direction for Jermel Charlo, though. He's talking about fighting anywhere in between 168 back down to 154. Remember, he actually entertained the possibility of moving back down in weight after a Canelo fight to fight Terence Crawford at 154. In truth, I don't actually expect Jermel Charlo to do that, but should we expect him to fight David Benavidez if he wins? Should we expect him to fight Caleb Plant? If he beats Canelo. If he beats Canelo, there may be a rematch. There may be a second fight for a lot of money. He's saying he's going to bring up that Texas heat. Show up and show out in the Canelo Alvarez fight. Canelo Alvarez himself has moved his camp to Truckee, California. High altitude and the benefits that come from that. While Jermel Charlo braves the Texas heat in preparation for the biggest fight of his career. And I got the call for this fight. There was nothing I could say other than let's go. My whole career has been all kind of about chasing Canelo. He's been the top guy for a long time. The fight has presented itself now and I just have to get in there, do my job and be the best that I can be, Charlo said during a press conference at the Beverly Hilton. After September 30th, people are going to appreciate my skills and what I've been doing for so long. Ever since I was a kid, with every fight, I come to put on a show and I'm a dangerous guy the whole fight. I want to be known as great. His desire to be known, his desire to be great. I do think he's a hungrier fighter than his twin brother, Jamal. I think his hunger and his desire to be known, to be great, 
comes from that, that rivalry between brothers. There was a time when Jermel was known as the Little Charlo. Remember that? A few years ago, he was known as the Little Charlo, while Jermel was the more talked about brother of the two, especially after that highlight knockout win over a then unbeaten Julian Williams. The tables have turned since then. Maybe he felt all those years ago that he was standing in his brother's shadow. Now he's the more talked about brother of the two. He's gonna find out, he being Canelo Alvarez, he's gonna find out that I'm the big Charlo. I am what I say I am. Canelo will see that I pack a good punch, that I have good lateral movement, and that I'm a ring general, just like he is. We'll see. He'll see that it won't be a walk in the park. He says he's gonna be better in this fight, and it's the same thing for me, said Charlo. The difference being that Jermel Charlo has not fought in over a year's time. He has not seen action since the Brian Castaño fight over a year ago. Over a year later, he will be campaigning at a higher weight, a much higher weight than he's ever campaigned, and while he might have the right size frame to carry the weight and fill out. He's not acclimated yet, and this ain't no tune-up fight. This ain't no ham and that guy he's fighting. I'm gonna bring that Texas heat. I'm gonna show up and show out. I'm gonna have fun and do what I do. This is what I love to do. I'm gonna represent the culture and put on a show. Even if he falters, he still wins. Even if he falters, it's a win-win situation for Jermel because this really is the most sought-after fight anywhere in between 154 and 175 pounds. Any number of guys anywhere in between those four weight classes that would love to share the ring with Canelo Alvarez if for no other reason than what they stand to make from the fight. I don't even think some of those guys want to win. They just want to get paid. But out of all those guys, I do feel like Jermel, perhaps more so than some others, more so than his brother, Jermel, yeah. and more so than Demetrius Andre, more so than David Benavidez or David Morrell, Jermel has already made history in his own way. He became his division's undisputed champion. That matters. Saying, it's not about how many times you fall, it's about how you come back. He, unlike his brother Jamal, he has a blemish on his record. He lost to Tony Harrison. But you tell me who's on the up and up right now. Jermall might be the one with the unblemished record, but Jermall is also the one with absolutely no momentum in his career right now, whereas Jermall, who suffered a loss and suffered a draw. First Brian Castaño fight. It's not about how many times you fall, said Charlo on Big Boy TV. It's about the comeback. So many guys are protecting their unblemished record. So many guys are protecting their O. Oh, losing momentum in doing so are never amassed any. They're trying to be like Floyd is what they are, not understanding that even though Floyd went undefeated in his career, he did fight the somebodies. He did fight the fighters that people wanted to see him fight, which is why his pay-per-views were so successful, whether you like him or not. Couldn't have made that kind of money without fighting the somebodies of his era. Whereas these guys, they think it's all about staying undefeated. They think it's all about the O. You're never going to make the kind of money Mayweather made without fighting the interesting fighters in the interesting fights. Jermel said, everybody's trying to be Mayweather. The era has changed. Mayweather went through it, but he's one of a kind. Couldn't have said it better myself. Everybody ain't Floyd. You want to make Mayweather money? You've got to fight people. People that other people want to see you fight. It's not just about having an unblemished record. Demetrius Andre has an unblemished record, but how much more key value has he got? How much? I think Jermel Charlo made history in a way that his brother, Demetrius, David, they didn't. And that's at least in part why he got this fight. One undisputed champion versus another undisputed champion. Finally, ahead of this weekend's fight, this weekend's rematch between Chris Eubank Jr. and Liam Smith, Roy Jones says, I think Chris Eubank Jr. lost faith in me. I'm glad he's with Bo Mack. You know, Roy was a great fighter, and he was even a great commentator. I mean, he was really one of the greats, one of the best to ever lace him up. But you can't say the same about his abilities as a trainer. I mean, you can't say he's had the same success in that area. And that's okay. He feels like Eubank lost faith in his abilities as a trainer. I think complacency was a factor going into that fight. It affected his training completely because usually he would listen to what I'd tell him to do. But during the training camp, there were several times where he'd question me or if I'd tell him something, he'd beg to differ, Jones told Sporting Post. When they start to question you, they either don't believe you or they're second guessing what you're saying. So if you're second guessing, what I'm saying, you should go with someone you believe. 
So I'm glad that he's gone with Bo Mack. This harkens back to something that Liam Smith said ahead of this rematch, that Chris Eubank Jr.'s ego is too big, that having Brian Bo Mack McIntyre in his corner won't make a difference because Chris won't listen. Hmm. Bo Mack is fresh to him, and maybe he can develop some faith in Bo Mack because one day during training for the Smith fight, a sparring partner threw a headshot, and Chris went to protect his body and tried to dodge the headshot off. I told him it's better to protect the headshot than the body shot, and he told me that he begged to differ. I'm the pound for pound greatest fighter of all time saying that, but I said, okay, because I've never seen Chris hurt, and I've never seen him down, so you can't argue with that. But when you start saying things like that to me, it means you're losing confidence in what I'm telling you. I think he lost faith in me. I don't know why. Hmm. But when he started questioning me, to me, that's an immediate sign you don't believe in what I'm telling you. All because you've not been knocked down. Here's what I think. The truth is somewhere in the middle. It could be exactly the way that Roy says it is, that Chris lost faith. But why? Maybe it's because as a trainer, Roy needs a little bit more experience. He's never trained a world champion or something like that. I don't care if you've not been knocked down before. A shot to the body isn't going to leave a cut on your stomach. Nobody will get cut from a body shot, but a head shot can leave you cut. So I was talking from experience, but when you question that, then it puts a little bit of a damper on things. But now you've been down. You can't argue with me now, because now you understand why I said it. Yeah. Sometimes when you get complacent, people don't heat advice. I think he thought Smith would be a little bit easier than it turned out to be. Two things can be true at the same time. Maybe Roy's not the best coach. Not right now. Maybe he's not the best coach. But maybe Chris isn't the best student. Could be true also if he's not adhering to your counsel. I feel like Roy was training him to fight like he used to fight. Training him to be like Roy when Chris isn't Roy Jones Jr. And he's not gonna be. Then why is it encouraging that he enlisted the aid of Brian Bo Mac McIntyre? It's not that I think Bo Mac can reinvent the wheel with Chris Eubank Jr. In truth, it takes a while for a fighter and a trainer to develop a rapport, especially if you're bouncing from one trainer to another. It's not necessarily that he hired Bo Mac specifically so much as he wants to do things differently. Do something different from the first fight going into the second. And that's the right mindset. He has to change. He knows he has to. He's got the right idea there. Now, Brian Bo Mac McIntyre has more experience coaching fighters and world champions than Roy Jones Jr. does. Remember, he redeemed Jamel Herring, helped get him to the WBO title, and obviously, Bo Mac's work with Terrence Crawford. He's got more experience as a coach than Roy, at a higher level than Roy. I think at least for now, I think at least for this fight, Chris Eubank Jr. will listen. He knows that he has to. That's why he went from Roy over to Brian. I think he's gonna win. I don't like Chris Eubank Jr. I actually enjoyed seeing Liam Smith knock him out. But I think he's gonna win. If he stays on the balls of his feet, uses his athleticism, uses the jab, stays out of the pocket with Liam, stays out of those exchanges. If he boxes, he can win. That's what Brian's been saying. They're not there for a war. They're there for a boxing match. That's what I think Chris is going to do. He's going to box him up and win a points decision. That's what I think.